evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Welcome to this webinar celebrating the launch of the Mother's Milk Tool. I am Honorary Associate Professor Julie Smith from the Australian National University. Together with my colleagues, Roger Matheson and Duan Guyen from Alive and Thrive Southeast Asia and Naomi Hull from the World Breastfeeding Trends Initiative Australia, we will chair and manage the webinar tonight. We're pleased to be supported by FHI Solutions who've contributed important funding for the development of the Mother's Milk Tool. It's been a delight and a privilege to work with our colleagues at Alive and Thrive who organised this important support for the tool and for the event. Roger will introduce Alive and Thrive in a moment. We're also grateful to our friends at the ANU Gender Institute and several mother support groups and networks such as the Australian Breastfeeding Association, the Breastfeeding Promotion Network of India, Aragon from the Philippines and the Indonesian Breastfeeding Mothers Association. Breastfeeding a mother's milk is presently not counted in food systems or the economy and should be. The mother's milk tool we hope will help. As many of us prepare to celebrate Mother's Day, we're looking forward tonight to hearing from an outstanding lineup of speakers on the mother's milk tool. We'll introduce our speakers in a moment. Meanwhile, you will find a link to the detailed program and biographies of the speakers in the chat. Please introduce yourself there. We're recording the webinar and it will be on the web page in due course. We're also going to hold a poll later in the webinar where you, our wonderful webinar participants, get to choose the logo for the tool. So stay around for a bit of excitement as well as some amazing presentations on the tool from around the world. Next slide, please, Naomi. Breastfeeding is part of our human cultural heritage, but it's been badly disrupted in many countries. This meeting is being hosted on the traditional lands of the Garnawal and Gambri people. The Indigenous women of Australia have been living, working, birthing, breastfeeding and raising children successfully on this country for tens of thousands of years. Their skills and knowledge about safe infant and young child feeding, including breastfeeding and safe complementary feeding, has been key to their health and survival. We have much to learn from Indigenous women and history. Eminent historian Geoffrey Blaney has written about Indigenous Australians that a mother normally fed a child at the breast until the age of three or four. Abandoned breastfeeding at an early age was risky. The alternative to animal's milk was not available. Okay. Thank you. Period of breastfeeding curbed the mortality of infants. A prolonged breastfeeding helped to space her births. The traditional emphasis, he said, on breastfeeding was a boon for the Aborigines. I've used the tool to estimate that Indigenous Australian women provided well over 2 million litres of milk and up to perhaps 7 million litres to their babies and children in 1788. However, nowadays our Indigenous Australian children are less likely to be breastfed at every age than non-Indigenous children, including in remote as well as urban locations. Little data has been collected on their breastfeeding practices and minimal resources have been invested in repairing the damage to this important traditional breastfeeding culture. We hope the tool can help make the case for such investment. I would now like us to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I will now hand over to Roger Matheson from Alive and Thrive. Yeah, thank you, Julie. So welcome everyone to this uh, exciting lounge. Uh, it's an innovation, it's a global new tool called the Mother's Milk Tool. Um, and I am Roger Matheson. I'm um, the regional director for Alive and Thrive uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, and Alive and Thrive is an initiative to save lives, uh, prevent illness and ensure healthy growth and development of mothers and children. Uh, I'm also leading FHI Solutions Innovation Incubator. And FHI Solutions is a subsidiary of FHI 360, and it's an international nonprofit supported by three centers of excellence, so Alive and Thrive, uh, but also Intake and Thousand Days. Um, 
as highlighted during the UN Food Systems Summit and also the related dialogues, uh, breastfeeding and mother's milk uh, is presently not counted for in food systems um, or the economy, and it should be. So this new mother's milk tool will help um, and hopefully cha help change that. So I'm very excited to see that so many colleagues and friends, uh, participant, participants are joining from around the world. Um, and at a very relevant time when many countries are also celebrating Mother's Day. Um, we are looking forward to hearing from, we, from you and we are very grateful for your support, sharing information about this tool. Um, the tool and the numbers it generates, it helps uh, illuminate or put spotlights on the contributions by mothers uh, to the economy and the society. Um, and this powerful evidence can furthermore inform and trigger change in the enabling environment and supportive policies and practices. So you can start immediately. Um, you can help with the dissemin dissemination and uptake of the tool by joining the conversation online. So you can use the social media kit we have prepared and one of my colleagues are now sharing that in the chat box. Um, please use the hashtag mother's milk tool in all your posts. That's our primary hashtag. Uh, so we are able to track the communication uh, but also take advantage of secondary kind of hashtags such as Mother's Day 2022 to ensure that we have a broader reach. Uh, and on the next slide, you can see the, the hashtag, um, just as a reminder. Uh, and also please um, use our handles and, and tag us on Alive and Thrive, FHI Solutions and Anu Pop Health. So thank you and over to you, Noel Mual. Uh, unless you're already busy tweeting or maybe even on TikTok. Actually, I'll just leave those there for a bit longer in case you need to jot them down. Thank you very much, Julie and Roger. This is a really exciting launch tonight. I'm here on the land of the Turrbal and the Yuggera people in Brisbane, Australia, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. On behalf of the World Breastfeeding Trends Initiative of Australia, I'm excited to be able to support this launch of the Mother's Milk Tool tonight. We're looking forward to seeing how this tool can be used by policymakers to include breast milk in their budgets, balance sheets and estimates. I hope it highlights the cost savings of ensuring that mothers are supported to reach their breastfeeding goals and the global nutrition target of 50% of babies exclusively breastfed to six months by 2025. Tools such as this play an important role in advocacy. This will add to the growing kit of tools that already includes the World Breastfeeding Trends Initiative tool and the World Breastfeeding Costing Initiative. These have already been used successfully for almost two decades now and are building a growing database um, that shows progress or lack thereof in over 100 countries across the globe. For tonight's webinar, um, we really do love to hear who's here with us um, and where you're from. So please use the chat to introduce yourselves. Uh, if you have any questions, they can also be added to the chat uh, and time permitting, we will endeavour to address some of those at the end of the session. Any questions that remain unanswered, we're hoping to put together a frequently asked questions document uh, and we will be able to answer them for you there. We ask that conversation in the chat keeps on track and on topic and that it remains respectful. The chat will be monitored and we reserve the right to remove anyone from the webinar. Please keep your microphone off throughout the webinar to reduce noise and distractions. Uh, and it can also help to leave your video off as well. Um, just helps with bandwidth for everyone that's here. So moving along to our program, we, we have a an awesome program tonight, a lot to get through. We'll do our best to stay on time. We'll be starting off with um, Professor Dame Waring, um, followed by Julie, and followed then by Alessandro Alamo. We will hear some user perspectives of the tool and some more speakers towards the end then. Dr. Phil Baker, Ms. Francis Knight, 
and then we'll be joined by Tuan from Alive and Thrive to do some Q&A and answer those questions that you've popped in the chat for us. We also have a poll at the end. So we hope you can stay through it, stay with us through to the end. And I'm going to hand over to Julie now. Thanks very much, Julie. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Roger. It is my immense pleasure to introduce Professor Dame Marilyn Waring. Professor of Public Policy at Auckland University of Technology from, of course, Auckland, New Zealand, Aotearoa. Marilyn is a New Zealand feminist, former politician, author, academic and activist for female human rights and environmental issues. She's best known for her 1988 book, If Women Counted, and she obtained a Doctor of Philosophy in Political Economy in 1989. Through her research and writing, she's known as the principal founder of the discipline of feminist economics. She's outspokenly criticized the concept of GDP, the economic measure that became a foundation of the United States, the United Nations system of national accounts following World War II. She criticizes a system which counts oil spills and wars as contributors to economic growth, while child rearing and housekeeping are de deemed valueless. valueless. Her work has influenced academics, government accounting in several countries and United Nations policies. In 2020, Marilyn was appointed a Dame Companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit for services to women and to economics. So you can see why I'm so thrilled for Marilyn to be with us. Um, please welcome Marilyn Waring. Over to you, Marilyn. Tēnā uh, koutou katoa. Greetings to you all from Aotearoa, New Zealand. And thank you, Julie, for your invitation to be part of Alive and Thrive launch. Now, for me, a singular characteristic of Julie's work for 20 years has been exploring strategies to change the paradigm, which attributes no value to breastfeeding. And I'm excited to hear from the number of specialists who are going to share with us how the tool will help their work. Julie's work has traversed an extensive range of political questions. And these have been pursued with a rigor energized by a passion for the rights of women and children, but informed by early years working on the inside in the treasuries of both New Zealand and the Australian government and <clears throat> in ministries of finance, prime minister and cabinet, environment and water. I don't know any other economist with certificates in breastfeeding education. Now, just six days ago, the World Health Organization advised that formula milk companies paying social media platforms and influencers to gain direct access to pregnant women and mothers at a vulnerable time in their lives. And throughout the pandemic, this pervasive marketing has been increasing the purchases of breast milk substitutes and dissuading mothers from breastfeeding exclusively. Um, Dr. Francesca Branca at the World Health Organization described the marketing as powerful, insidious, and inexcusable. And has been mentioned, the sale of substitutes and the marketing are all seen as good for growth in the economy, while the best food on the planet counts for nothing. In 2021, I was invited to become a member of the World Health Organization Council on the Economics of Health for All. And I want to share some parts of our recent paper on valuing health for all and rethinking and building a whole of society approach. So we wrote, if health and well-being are within the reach of every person on this planet, and health for all is the goal, then what do societies need in, to value to achieve this? And how do we create metrics to steer and evaluate the reshaping and redirection that the economy must undergo to achieve health for all? 
we recognise that, quote, no universal metric can encompass all the diverse components of health for all, especially not a monolithic monetary measure like GDP. So we must move toward data collection and measurements globally that abandon such indices and alternative metrics, such as the tool that value the health of people and the planet along multiple dimensions through a full spectrum holistic approach is what we need. And these metrics need to include, these frameworks need to include new metrics, not just lactation, but the food growing, the cooking, cleaning, childcare, unpaid household and community activities, including environmental conservation, overwhelmingly performed by women, all of these tasks. And time use data can help reveal a lot about these hidden activities and begin to capture their true value and to support policy making in a number of ways, including in-depth knowledge of what requires additional investment, which is another target, another strategy around this tool. The council didn't waste words. We described, quote, a pathological obsession with gross domestic product, an inappropriate measure of progress that perversely rewards profit-generating activities that harm people and destroy ecosystems. So Mother's Milk Tool, we launched, does value and measure women's productivity. And yes, it is very strange that in the national income accounts of New Zealand, the milk from sheep, goats, cows, and buffaloes is counted, but the best food on the planet for infants, mother's milk, counts for nothing. However, we walk a very fine moral and ethical tightrope in the strategies we use to call for redistribution of a government's financial resources to those who do the most work. When I wrote the first edition of Counting for Nothing, 1987-88, I did argue that we should make monetary estimates of all unpaid productive service and reproductive work, including lactation, and estimates of environmental services in the gross domestic product. I could see that if this happened, that would overwhelm the national accounts framework, and we might have to go back to ground zero. But the Statistical Commission also recognized that and set up satellite accounts for uh, the work mostly women do that lies beyond the production boundary and for the environment. But as I gained some distance from parliamentary office and the GDP paradigm that governs our nation's annual budgets, I recognized I did not want to see the characteristics of our planet and our lives, which are of an inestimable value, included in a national accounting framework, which rewards war, slavery, trafficking in people, drugs, armaments, um, ecological devastation, named growth and progress. And I want to mention my World Health Organization colleague, Maxim, who is trying to join us tonight from the Ukraine and who understands the incredible rise in GDP productivity that is occasioned by war. This paradigm is not a path forward. In the first days of the COVID pandemic, it demonstrated that politicians had to call on and make judgments across a wide range of data from many sources. They should not return to GDP 
We do not want that business as usual. For example, an environment is best measured by its natural characteristics, as we do in health policy with air and water, for example. From Julie's earliest work, the environmental impacts of breastfeeding vis-a-vis -vis milk formula have been a focus. And I understand the planetary health aspect is to be developed as an environmental add-on, the tool. Unpaid work, all of it, including that that's supposed to be collected in subsistence work. There was a change in the rules of the boundary of production in 1993, but that's all that changed, the rules. It was never carried out in practice. And this work is best measured by time use. And a woman's time investment in breastfeeding calculator is also to be added to the tool in the future. Now, most people online understand that the sustainability of the health system depends on women. The gross domestic product paradigm uses unpaid women to cut health, health costs, to achieve a much wider coverage of health care, and to reduce pressure on the health system. There are satellite accounts for unpaid work that use market estimates of time use. As I've made clear, it's not a path I like, but let's make clear they're all grossly understated. Time use data seldom counts simultaneous activities, which is a common and efficient practice of most women. But not counting simultaneous activities, the estimates are much lower because they underestimate productivity. I certainly know women who multitask when breastfeeding. And some of that multitasking actually is another point about the estimates not accounting for worry work. The daily work that can't ever be postponed, the organizing, the logistics, the management, the administration of a household, and its members. The estimates usually use proxy wage values that mirror women's pay inequities. And the data obscures really significant fishing, agriculture, horticulture, conservation, crafts, manufacturing, and maintenance were done by women who don't live in cities or easily accessible rural areas, who are seldom counted for all that they do in the Census of Agriculture or the Household Labour Force Survey. And they're not an easy target for under-resourced time use studies. And the market estimates approach has often reduced the complexity of the tasks that women do unpaid to household or care work without understanding the specialist skills that are frequently engaged. And in 2019, writing on the tool for estimating economic losses from low breastfeeding rates, Julie recognized this. Two of her four key messages were that the tool excluded additional unpaid household care, sick children, and that made the tool conservative. And that proper accounting of those costs requires more adequate time use data. Now, I'm trying to differentiate unpaid health care work from this generic term of care work. Because unpaid health care work for those who are fully dependent has particular characteristics, and it's not covered by the everyday routines of cleaning, laundry, cooking, housework. So Duran has noticed that it includes, for example, pre-diagnosis, providing me medicines, monitoring symptoms, checking vital signs, look at sometimes making herbal curative treatments, 
often transportation, liaison services with any form of health system, um, obtaining medicines, making payments. Full-time unpaid care of dependents demands constant availability, constant responsibility, and constant management. It can't be postponed. And the pathetic economic estimates of the market value of doing this work are degrading. The responsibility is immense. Everything that would be done in a care institution for dependents has to be done in the home without economies of scale. The Alive and Thrive initiative will celebrate what women contribute to health for all from pregnancy and birth. It will also assist so many advocates with data they don't have. Congratulations to you all. And I look forward to hearing from so many perspectives about how this change will, what change this will make the lives of women and children. Thank you, Marilyn. We are so privileged to hear your thoughts on the tool tonight, and I so appreciate your wisdom um, cast on our endeavours and looking forward um, to seeing how these things play out in WHO and, of course, in the United Nations type forums. It's now time, I think, to move on to my presentation. Um, so we could move seamlessly into that, I believe. Um, Naomi will load the slide. And okay. So next slide, please. As Marilyn has indicated, our global systems for measuring the productive economy reflect misguided and outdated principles about what's important and valuable. I hope from this webinar talk, you'll come to recognize the human and planetary health costs of not breastfeeding, to know that a little bit about the international statistical framework, including GDP and how it treats breastfeeding, learn about the economic value about, of breastfeeding and how it can be measured and calculated and understand the thinking behind the tool. And of course, to see the uses and the importance of this tool for measuring the amount of production and monetary value of breast milk at country, regional and global level. So to introduce me, next slide please. For the past 20 years, I've been doing research on economic aspects of breastfeeding and markets for mother's milk funded by the Australian Research Council. This has included research on time use of new mothers. And as Marilyn mentioned previously in the late 1980s, I was a senior economist in the Australian and New Zealand treasuries, including in the national accounts area. I also have 30 years experience as a breastfeeding counsellor and 20 years as executive member of the board of directors for the Australian Breastfeeding Association. It was during my time in New Zealand Treasury that Marilyn Waring's book was launched and inspired me to measure the economic value of breastfeeding and human milk in a national accounting framework, that is in GDP. Since 2015, my research has been funded by an ARC Future Fellowship, which has focused on enhancing measurement approaches to emerging markets and trade in mother's milk with the aim to improve methods to measure the economic value of breastfeeding. Through a partnership with Alive and Thrive, this research has underpinned the development of the Mother's Milk tool. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk briefly about this international system. I'm going to touch on the planetary health economics for mammals, as I call it. Briefly about GDP and measures of productive economic productivity and value and why we need to include mother's milk in, and breastfeeding in economic statistics. I'll talk about the thinking behind the mother's milk tool and how it might help to make the work of breastfeeding visible and valued. And I'll also lay out a broader agenda. Next slide, please. So human beings are mammals and milk helps build a system in human babies. 
it's the first inoculation against disease. And when women and children are not enabled to breastfeed sufficiently, there are profound effects to human health and cognition, as well as food security and nutrition. Next slide, please. The health cost implications of not breastfeeding, what I call cross-species nursing, are large. Many people do not understand that formula milk is cow's milk designed for a calf. The cost of not breastfeeding tool developed by Alive and Thrive, which Marilyn mentioned, makes it easy to see some of the costs for humans when children are not breastfed. Frances Knight will talk about this tool later in the webinar. Nowhere is there a framework or tool that counts the other externalities or costs associated with the use, the production and use of commercial milk formula, such as the cost to the planet or the cost to other non-human animals. Next slide, please. So there are unmeasured costs of not breastfeeding that add to the burden both on the environment and on women. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. 50 years ago, World Bank nutritionist Alan Berg talked on the invisible losses of a national nutrition, a valuable national resource. He talked about the poor countries of the world, but the crisis in infant feeding is a global one and it's ongoing. I'll come back to this later. Next slide, please. I'll just give you a chance to read that slide. Next slide, please. So the system of national accounts was introduced in the 1950s as a standardized way of measuring GDP. It became how economic performance and progress is measured, but it mainly only counts money transactions. Before that, some countries had counted subsistence production and unpaid household production, but these were taken out. This system has shaped social norms and beliefs about what is important. It counts commercial milk formula production, but it doesn't count women's unpaid work, including breastfeeding. Next slide, please. This system depletes women through hiding the unequal sharing of work burdens. Unpaid work measured by time use shows a value that is at least 40 to 50% of the size of GDP when this production is given a monetary value. Most of this work is by women. As Marilyn's mentioned, it has flaws even in the conception of how they measure time use. GDP growth significantly overstates economic performance because the marketization of economic activities, often just replacing what was done previously without payment. And a recent study by the OECD itself shows that GDP has been overstated by nearly two percentage points a year in major countries in recent decades, because non-marketed production of childcare, previously unpaid, has become marketized. And so it now counts as economic growth. Nothing's changed. Reform to this system is underway, but it's long overdue. Next slide, please. So despite the rules being amended in 1993 to allow it to be counted in GDP because it's a commodity that's within the rules, human milk production isn't counted in economic measures such as GDP and only one country in the world, Norway, includes human milk in its national balance, food balance sheet. So why do we want to count breastfeeding in food and economic statistics? At the biannual general conference of the National Accountants Association in Korea in 2017, Martin Durand, the OECD's chief statistician asked me, why would you do this? It's about mother's love, not money. And my answer was that this invisibility affects its perceived importance. And so it affects policy priorities and budgets and resourcing of what women do. So highlighting the national economic impact of breastfeeding underlines its importance and the desirability of protecting it, emphasizes its extent and its value, 
and gives women a sense of pride, I should say, too. And from a policymaker viewpoint, a more comprehensive knowledge of the nature and locus of economic activity also contributes to better economic uh, public policy analysis. Next slide, please. So if you don't measure it in GDP or in food statistics, then it's assumed it has a zero value in terms of the economic policy making. And this in turn makes that problem that I've mentioned, which is it's hard to make a compelling policy case, a business case for action. Money is the language, unfortunately, of policymakers. What happens instead is that policies and investments by government prioritise protection, promotion and support for other producers. And in fact, many of us in Australia are absolutely dismayed to see over half a million dollars given by the Australian government to marketing commercial milk formula in Asia. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned previously, the United Nations systems uh, guidelines are now that the production of goods such as human milk is counted within GDP, although services such as breastfeeding is not. So this gives us a little bit of wriggle room and we can argue for it to be counted in GDP. And I'm gonna talk more now about how we do that. Statistics matter because they're the evidence on which policy is built. Next slide, please. The two influential, um, two very, in fact, very influential Nobel Prize winners in economics um, actually did a review of this, a very influential review uh, in 2009 and concluded that our measurement systems were dis in fact distorting our economic priorities. What we measure, they said, affects what we do and if our measurements are flawed, decisions may be distorted and that's indeed what has been happening. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So as a result of feminist advocacy, some changes are now being discussed at these high level forums, including time use accounting. Uh, Marilyn, you may recognize <laughs> Arthur Grimes there from, from Aotearoa, New Zealand. We have one foot in the door for breastfeeding because it's clear that all mother's milk production should be counted in GDP under the existing rules. And if breastfeeding was more visible, greater funding priority might be given to programs which expand human milk production by increasing breastfeeding, such as implementing the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative, financing access to peer counsellor or health professional lactation support, introducing paid maternity leave, and requiring breastfeeding accommodation in workplaces, as well as regulating the behaviour of the competitors to breastfeeding. Big formula. Next slide, please. At the National Statisticians Conference last year, I estimated quantities and monetary values at key points in the 20th century. I won't go into it here, but you can see there was a huge drop. And at that point, those low points, this reflects the pattern all around the world, but those low points, nearly 70 to 90% of these countries' biological capacity was lost each year. And that remains the situation in a country which I'll mention shortly. Next slide, please. So the Stiglitz and Fatusi review, the one by the Nobel Prize winners in economics, concluded the news the example of mother's milk is an example of how it provides biased data, biased accounts of the economy. They said there's a serious omission in the valuation of home produced goods and GDP, clearly within the value of breast milk, clearly within the system of national accounts, production boundary with important non-trivial large also has important implications for public policy and child and maternal health. So next slide, please.
So if you look at how much milk's been produced over time, it's very revealing. As I mentioned, it's dramatically declined since the 1850s when I looked at this data, but it's still enough to affect measured GDP growth in some countries. And I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Next slide, please. So the value of breastfeeding is far beyond its monetary aspect. But data and knowledge of its economic value can better acknowledge women's unique contribution, inform public policy and emphasize the importance of breastfeeding. So we felt there needed to be a tool. Next slide. We looked at previous studies in this area. There have been three types and we looked at the third of these to develop a tool for calculating the economic value of breastfeeding. This is going to look at both the volume the quantity and the monetary value of breastfeeding and subsequently the costs of lost mother's milk. Next slide. The key information to be used, you can see here, number of children, breastfeeding practices, daily human milk intake and a price, which I'm gonna talk about a little more. Next slide. Breastfeeding rates come from United Nations data or national statistics, and we use we cover zero to 36 months. For many countries, breastfeeding data is poor, and we developed a prediction model using regression analysis. A chart in the tool shows more details on breastfeeding rates that are generated by the predictor. The tool allows individual mothers to calculate how much milk they have produced for their child and its value, depending on how many months the child is breastfed. You can see for, from this, for example, that a mother who breastfeeds to six months and then continues breastfeeding her child to two years will provide around 431 litres for her child over that period. Next slide, please. You can see similar numbers for other periods of of duration of breastfeeding. Next slide, please. National accountants use a variety of pricing methods to calculate the values of non-market production. In calculating GDP, they value production at market prices as reflected in market transactions, even if some production is not sold. If a market price isn't available, they'll infer its value by measuring the cost of inputs to its production. And this is also possible, applicable to valuing human milk. You can put a monetary valuation on mother's milk production, although of course, as I said, breastfeeding is far beyond its, its monetary value and it's far beyond just the milk. National statistics agencies already um, put a value on non-marketed production of foods such as eggs or milk or other food produced and consumed at home or in farm households. Next slide, please. So mostly it's not marketed, but economists have used a variety of approaches. The monetary values, next slide, please. For a variety of reasons, we've taken human milk production as being valued at the price for expressed human milk sold by milk banks. And I can talk a little bit more about that if people are interested. So how the, how the tool can help, let me talk about that. Let me see if I can turn off this wretched. So the tool will help to quantify the volume of breast milk and the value of breastfeeding at national, regional and global levels. Next slide, please. It will help measure progress towards national and global breastfeeding targets and inform updating of national policies, programs and investment plans. It'll help ensure greater investments and resources are allocated towards the protection, promotion and support of breastfeeding. And it can also help give mothers confidence and motivation about the value of what she does for her child. And I know as a breastfeeding counsellor, I've said to women, look, just sit and relax, feed your baby. You're doing something immensely valuable just by sitting and feeding and cuddling your baby. You don't have to be doing rushing around doing the housework. Next slide, please. 
So there's some stunning numbers here, really stunning numbers um, that you can generate from the tool by yourself, print them out, go and visit your local decision maker, policy maker, minister. The sad bit is globally around a third of potential production is lost. So potential is defined that 98% of women potentially could breastfeed if they were supported and enabled by the right policies, right programs, adequate resourcing. So you can see that around a third is lost. If you look at the next slide, please, you'll see that this equates to around 21.9 billion litres. 21.9 billion litres of the perfect baby food is not is, is wasted. We're not getting it because governments fail to invest in supporting women to breastfeed. Even at a monetary value at quite low one of $100 a litre, which is what we use in the tool, we're losing over $2.2 trillion a year of this unique invaluable food. I always have to check those numbers because they're such staggeringly large numbers. Next slide, please. Here we have a country, Nepal, where less than 5% potentially of the production is lost. This is an approximation, of course. We don't account for exclusive breastfeeding because the data was too poor for in most countries. But in Nepal, approximately 96% of its biologically feasible levels are still produced. If you compare that with the GDP of Nepal, it's well over half the GDP of Nepal if Nepal had to buy it. So little is lost at present, but what is protecting it? Let's have a look and see what the future might look like. Next slide, please. Ireland. Ireland, 82% of the milk is lost. This is the situation that we experienced in many countries during the 1960s. Ireland is a major producer of milk formula, unfortunately, for the babies of the world. Um, some big numbers there, but they're the wrong direction. Norway, next slide. So Norway is the only country in the world yet that um, provides estimates of mother's milk production for its food statistics. And they've been doing that since the 1990s. Our estimates give slightly higher results than their official estimates, which are published in their reports because we use higher estimations of yields. And also because the custom in Norway is not to breastfeed very long past 12 months. Um, so the production is lower than in some countries. And finally, my own country, Australia. Let's go to Australia. So in Australia, around two thirds of, its, of the milk's lost. We have a plan in Australia to do something about this, but we're not collecting data on it. Um, and so we don't know where we're really at, but yes, around a two thirds is lost. So what's next? To measure the health and environmental costs of milk formula and depletion of, of these assets in economic statistical systems, counting breastfeeding and mother's milk production in national food balance sheets, food statistics and food surveillance systems. These are bold and wide ranging actions that are needed to preserve this crucial global food resource. We need to measure what matters and stop counting milk formula production as valuable while not counting breastfeeding at all. The expansion of formula sales is actually an indicator not of economic progress, but of our society's failure to, to provide fair and equal resources for women and children. And the failure to measure the health, development, and environmental costs of not breastfeeding. Next slide. We also need to be creating experimental accounts to value mother's milk in country GDP in the system of national accounts. And we urgently need a system of national accounting time use accounts for infant and young child feeding and care. Children, whether they're breastfed or not, young children are very time intensive and that should be the starting point for any time accounting system. So finally, next slide, lost milk is substantial. As we can conclude, 
but the loss is not measured. The invisibility of this economic loss distorts public policy priorities. It also severely undermines the credibility of economic data. Next slide, please, Naomi. So I will end there on that thought. A reminder that at present national economic output measures show a decline if more babies are breastfed and a, and a rise if commercial baby foods displace breastfeeding. These are ridiculous results and severely undermine the public credibility of GDP estimates and other economic data. I said that in, 19, in 2006 in the paper and that work at that time already was inspired by our wonderful opening um, speaker tonight, Marilyn Waring. So that's me, and I'm now going to introduce Alex Yellamo to take you through how to use the tool. So Alex is, um, is one of the key developers of the tool and has been working enormously hard on this over the past year or so. Alex is an independent consultant based in the United Kingdom at the moment. Um, he's a maternal infant and young child feeding specialist in development and emergency settings. So you're as likely to find him in Yemen or Ethiopia or Poland, or Bangladesh, the Philippines, all sorts of places that most of us try and get away from. He has extensive expertise in infant and young child feeding policies and practices, particularly in emergencies and on the WHO International Code and other global tools. He's previously worked with UNICEF and WHO in various ways. I'll hand over now to Alex and he can take you through using the tool um, online. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Julie. And I'm really delighted to be here today. I am trying to share my screen and I think I'm getting there. Okay, uh, Julie and colleagues, uh, before starting, I really would like to acknowledge the team that has been instrumental uh, to date as of last night, literally, in their time zone. Uh, the team composed by René Raya, I hope René is on the call, as well as Roseanne Batugas. They are both in the Philippines and they've done a fantastic job in during the whole development and conceptualization of the tool. And René has really spearheaded and led the development of the prediction model. Now, let's go to the tool. It's just a walkthrough. Julie gave some already some insights on how, on the assumptions and some of the variables that are, uh, that you're going to see um, reflected in the tool. So again, it's just a brief um, walkthrough and I hope this will be sufficient to trigger your interest and excitement to go and download the tool, start using it and then reach out for questions and clarification and again, dissemination. So this is the landing page of the tool. Uh, just a very brief, uh, just to scroll down, you will see some of the key messages that were highlighted by Julie and some of the other presenters. You have a very simple set of instructions. The, one of the main goals um, of the development, during the development has really been to develop a very user-friendly intuitive uh, tool. And the second has been to develop the tool on a very common or let's say generally quite popular platform like Excel. So you have the basic instructions and then you have some of the key uh, materials that can be uh, reviewed online as well as printed and saved in, uh, in PDF format like uh, the advocacy piece the variables, the definition of all the variables used, the, the sources of data, and some of the explanation on how some of the data are calculated, some of the key references, and as well as the acknowledgements. Uh, from the landing page, you can then go to your main menu, and the tool is basically structure, is basically, sorry, providing two major options. The possibility to calculate or to estimate, as Julie mentioned earlier, uh, the volume and value of breast milk at the country level, as I said, as well as the option, even a very exciting option for individual moms and group of moms to estimate their own uh, volume and their own, um, and the value of what they've been producing. So I will just walk you through on both of these uh, options. Let's start from the country calculator. 
So you have the possibility to select the country of interest, most likely your country or other countries that you may be interested. And you can, let's say in the, in the name of my colleagues that have joined the team, let's look at the Philippines. When you select the Philippines, you will enter in, uh, in a simple uh, a country profile page that will basically give you the very basic information available and preloaded in the tool. So um, number of live birds, as you can see, uh, the source of information, in this case, mix, uh, the data of the source of information, 2017, and uh, in currency exchange vis-a-vis -vis the dollar, um, the most recent currency exchange that we were able to preload. And on the right side, you have all the uh, breastfeeding data, and this is any breastfeeding. It's not exclusive. It's uh, basically any breastfeeding at a certain month. And as Julie explained, we are looking at three years of age, so at 36 months. So assuming you are in this page, you have several options. The easiest of the options is that you trust or you uh, want to use the information already preloaded and available. And if you do so, meaning without changing or without wanting to change any of this information, you just have to go to the production and value page that will automatically uh, bring you to the calculations. Oh, no. To the calculations no. um, that Julie already presented for some of the countries. So in these calculations, you have the volume, the value, and the value in the local currency of breast milk produced. The same uh, will be available. Sorry, okay. The same is available for the total period of three years, or is break, broken down by age groups under six months, six twenty four months, and so on. So this is let's uh, let's call it the easier route. Uh, and again, going back to the main page, the profile of the country is the easier route, mostly when, as you can see, you have basically all the basic information. The full data set is available for breastfeeding, as well as the live births and the exchange rate. Let's, let's go to uh, the, another uh, scenario. Let's say the Philippines has released uh, another set of data, maybe in 2022, 2023, and you want to update uh, either the breastfeeding rates or you want to update other parameters like live births. So the tool can give you the opportunity to go to the data entry and you can basically customize any of the parameters that you can see in this page. So again, if a new data set is available or you want to use a data set that you feel it's more trustworthy from your end or you have more uh, confidence than what we have been using, then again, you just need to enter the breastfeeding rates if that's the data you want to uh, uh, update uh, as well, or you can change any of these parameters. Uh, as I said, like births, currency exchange. I am not gonna do it now just for the interest of time, but again, I would suggest you do uh, try to, to do it. And uh, what is very important, again, just from an instruction point of view, every time you update either the breastfeeding or other basic uh, uh, parameters, just remember to save and then to go back to the uh, your country profile, and then to go to your production page. This is more or less the process. Now let's go back again to the main menu and let's, let's go to a country that uh, may not have um, uh, all the information. And I believe we can go to, uh, I guess, Australia again, just Or sorry, maybe I want to get me, let's get a European country. Maybe I can get Italy, just in the name of my fellows. So um, one of the information that Julia shared uh, is that we have been trying to use all the available national uh, data when these are available. But as you know, for 
in general, uh, the big challenges has been with high income countries. So in Europe or in the US or in, uh, in, in the Pacific or in Australia in particular, New Zealand and so on, Canada. So this, is, this has been one of the biggest challenge. So you may have situations like in, in my country, like in Italy, where we don't have the full set of data. So again, what are the options for the user? Uh, the options remain the same, but there is some um, uh, additional uh, facility. One, you can decide just to estimate the value or volume and value of the produced breast milk by using the, the data points available. So in this case, just the three that you can see here. So I can just go to the production and you will see that the value and volume has been calculated for the three uh, months that are available in the data set. But what Julia has already mentioned to you, we have developed uh, a prediction model using a, a, um, a cubic regression uh, model that has been identified as the best fit for the situation, wherein we are giving you the possibility to, uh, to fill uh, the gaps no? and using this regression model. So basically you can decide to uh, complete the data set using the regression model mm -hmm. that is nowhere perfect. And again, I want, to rate, I want to emphasize, this is not a tool that should be used to compute breastfeeding data, but this, this was just, let's say, um, a fallback position when the, uh, as in many, uh, in several countries, I, want, I don't want to say many, but several countries, the data may not be available, the breastfeeding data. So in this case, the prediction model that has been uh, developed and tested for the past six to eight months actually um, will help you fill those gaps if you want to. And then again, as I said earlier, you can just, once you have um, completed the, you know, when the prediction has been made, you can then, uh, as I've been doing earlier, you can just uh, look at the uh, various, um, uh, of the, oh, sorry, the, the, the calculated uh, values. So you can see that in case, when, when you use the prediction, and I didn't show it earlier because I didn't do it, but or when you enter your own data, the tool will also generate side by side the data calculated using the prediction or your own data on the left. And on the right, we'll keep the data will show you the data calculated using the available information without any changes. I hope I, I'm clear. This will also give you an idea of potential differences. So for example, if I was using my own data for the Philippines, and this will help me compare the volume and values calculated using my own data for the Philippines and the full data set for, for of the existing data set for the country of interest. So, so these are basically the three uh, options that we have when working with country level information. So just to reiterate, you may use the, the data that are available that are preloaded that you may have that, that will show on your on the on the screen. You may decide to enter your own data just entering in this uh, in this template and uh, customizing it, or in case the data set preloaded is not complete, you may decide to complete it using the prediction model. So these are the three key options that will help you calculate, as we keep saying, both uh, volume and value for a country of interest. Let me go quickly on the, uh, on the menu for individual and this is again um, uh, for moms or group of moms that wants to uh, estimate the, their contribution in terms of how much they are able to produce, the, the, the volume of what they've, they've been doing in terms of breastfeeding, as well as the value, uh, the monetary value in this case for what they've been producing. The selection of the country is mainly related to the currency that we are going to use for the calculation. So I'm very fine to keep El Salvador 
So it's a much simpler uh, 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 module in this case. What the mom has to do is basically to say yes for the months where she has been breastfeeding uh, her child. So if she breastfed her child for, for the full 36 months, she will put uh, yes or why for all the for the period. If she only has done it for a ma ma lower uh, number of months, uh, she basically she just have to say yes to where the uh, when she has been able to breastfeed. And as you can see, automatically she will see on the right the volume in liters as well as the value in dollars of uh, uh, her breastfeeding um, efforts. Right. So. Uh, this can be saved and printed if the mom wants to keep a record of that. And uh, maybe a limitation, this is only for one child at a time. And uh, if you want to enter a new child, just uh, you need to reset and restart. So again, um, this is uh, very simple, uh, but remember you always need to save what you've been doing uh, or at least printing in a PDF and put it on your desktop or wherever you want because if not, once you move to the main menu, the information will be basically deleted. So uh, these are the two major uh, options available from the tool. And again, I hope you will enjoy. And just very briefly, if you allow me, I wanted to open the pages below. Uh, most likely this is something that can be of interest. So you see you have a detailed explanation of the various variables their definition based on, on months of work with Julie, Rene, and uh, Roseanne, and the other member of the team, Roger and Juan. The formula, if ever a formula has been used, a bit more explanation, and also, sorry, the web link for some of this in terms of where they're being resourced. Sorry, it went just uh, click down. Uh, just a second, okay the web link and some notes uh, in case, again, there are additional resources. So I think this is a very important page for those that wants really to go to the, to want to unpack a bit the logic and the assumptions behind the tool. So again, thank you everyone. Thank you, Julie, for, uh, Julie is the, the, the inventor, I would say. Me, Rene, and Roseanne have been just supporting her in translating uh, more than 20 years of advocacy into a practical, hopefully user-friendly and uh, exciting uh, tool. Thank you again. Uh, over to you, Julie. Thank you so much, Alex. And please leave the tool there just for one more minute and show people the little addition of the advocacy page that we have there, because this will allow you to print out a brief an advocacy brief to the minister that you're going to visit. And this has been done by Alex and team in very short time. I can't speak more highly. I mean, the work that the team has done on this has just been fantabulous. And that's not a word. So uh, it's just fantastic. You can print this out very easily. I did it this morning to give to a journalist a very quick kit to explain the data and a, a printout, as you saw from Alex's presentation of the results for your country. So it goes together as a beautiful little package with the print function there all ready to go. So well done, Alex and team. Thank you so much for the work that you've done in this area over the last one, two years almost, and especially the circumstances of uh, the work that you do makes it often very difficult and it's been an immense effort. <laughs> okay, thank you, Alex. And now over to some of the people who have tested Thor. And the first person that we're gonna hear from is Arun Gupta, who in fact was one of the pioneering researchers in this area when in 1993, he published a, an important paper on um, the, value, the economic value of breastfeeding in India. And at that time, he used the value of the price of formula to make that estimate. But the work that he did was hugely important in highlighting that value for India. So we're now going to ask Arun, who's a, formerly a paediatrician 
and who founded the Breastfeeding Promotion Network of India in 1991. He's going to give us some thoughts on the tool um, and also from his expert perspective. His organisation has played a key role in strengthening national policies in India to promote, protect and support breastfeeding. And in that country, they proudly have very little growth in the sales of breast milk substitutes because of the very strong efforts of BPNI and IBFAN to implement the WHO code. Over to you, Arun. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, can you hear me, Julie? We can hear you well. All right. Thank you, uh, you and Alex and Roger and the team which has come to this, uh, launch this tool. I, I share my heartiest congratulations to you people and making uh, over the last three decades, I think the things we are making a little simpler on the economics calculation front. So now I agree with you that 1993, a little story when John Rode, who used to work for UNICEF and now retired and lives in town, uh, he moved to um, India from uh, Indonesia and we met and we discussed, you know, how best to uh, move the policy maker. So we, we thought that economics is the language they understand. So that's the reason we did that paper together in 93. And then we uh, did publish it in economics and political weekly, which it probably reaches out to most of the bureaucrats and, and the policy makers, including politicians, you know, a couple of worst comments we did receive that why the hell you're comparing mothers with cows now. So because we use it, <laughs> values of the mother milk uh, to be compared to the what a, what a animal milk, which is rampantly available in India, would cost at that time about 15 rupees per liter is now around 50 rupees per liter. Arun, we are not hearing you properly because you're um, you suddenly covered the microphone. I think. Okay, can you hear me now? I am trying to because we, yes, we can hear you very well. Please continue. All right. So that was the time when uh, we we used some assumptions to calculate it in terms of uh, what percentage of women are exclusively breastfeeding. So we did zero to six months based on the percentage of exclusively breastfed women, and then from six to 12 months based on the uh, breastfeeding data per se, any breastfeeding between six to 12 months, and, and up to 24 months uh, based on an Indian study, how much production is there. So I will not get into the details of that, but we did try in 1998, a detailed paper once again in the National Medical Journal of India uh, with another colleague of mine, almost on a similar approach, but it was more expanded to the benefits and the, the, the things which we don't count actually. And the, the health benefits, the, the loss in terms of diarrhea or pneumonia or other illness the children face and they go to hospitals. So all those costs, we try to, you know, uh, add on to uh, add the value of the breast milk. Uh, certainly it added value to our advocacy, no doubt about that. And, uh, we certainly help the lip service to improve a lot. And slowly, when we started WBTI linked to it, and then we started getting more policy and program inputs. But somehow or the other, it's like after 2005 or six, India has not moved much uh, ahead, except the maternity leave for formal sector women increased from uh, three months to six months. So which does definitely cause, we haven't done the economics later uh, after that, but there are areas like unorganized sector women who do go out to work for economic reasons and the government uh, does pay a pittance to them for, for the compensation. Uh, uh, at the same time, a formal government employee gets six months leave and, and the poor woman gets about 5,000 rupees, which is not even $100 for six months. So th these are the challenges which we are facing, but having this tool, I would uh, like to not uh, take much of your time 
in terms of so, so many people have to speak. Uh, this tool actually is, is makes things a little more simpler than what the way we calculated at the time. And uh, you have got the database with you and you also allow the countries to use their data if they want to change. So that probably can be used to revive the advocacy efforts towards funding part, particularly in the national health accounts. We have tried a couple of times uh, last, uh, uh, when we did the 2018 uh, report of WBTI, which was the fifth report. But somehow a very little investment has been made in the area of support, as well as promotion, both in the hospitals, as well as in the maternity sector. We had a very strong law, which we got in 92 and 2003. We didn't need much money for that, but somehow we are now lacking money to implement the law in that sense. So uh, this tool in general, putting the uh, value of breastfeeding upfront and the policymakers may not be very, uh, they may not be impressed with the just a 14% loss because they have not been valuing um, uh, women's time in any case so far. But I, I, I think by writing a piece in the paper uh, during World Breastfeeding Week or something, I think uh, do, doing a recalculation and putting up a economic sheet again in the, in the country uh, para, with media as well as other policy makers might make sense again to revive this area of using the value of value of breastfeeding or breast milk uh, in economic terms. Certainly India has a national health account, so we will do uh, more uh, in terms of uh, going beyond the lip service. So thank you once again. This has been uh, a tremendous development in my opinion, and we hope to make use of it. I'll share across other parts of the friends in the fun. Uh, if people can try and, and make use of this, that will be so useful. Thank you, Julie, for inviting me. And, and thank, thank you, you all the team. Thank you so much. Arun is another person who's been very important in my progress in this area over the last many years. And together, he and Alex developed the, the WBTI costing tool, which we've been using in Australia to put in budget submissions to demand the funding for things. So I'm now going to introduce you to someone from Ireland, Malvina Walsh, um, who describes herself as the advocate for infant and young child feeding protection and support through the Baby Feeding Law Group. And Malvina is going to tell us something about her reaction to the tool and her experience of using it. So over to you, Malvina. Thank you, Julie. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you well. Great, thank you. My name is Malvina Walsh. Um, I'm a mother of three young children and joining you today from Ireland. I'm a member of the steering group of the Baby Feeding Law Group Ireland. We're a member of the IBFAN Network and a sister group of Baby Feeding Law Group UK. We advocate for the strengthening of legislation and policy to protect and support infant and young child feeding, engaging with key influencers and decision makers in this space. For example, healthcare workers, academia and politics to advocate for political intervention and thus systemic change. To do this, words and arguments must be crafted wisely and sensitively to the historic context as well as contemporary perceptions and attitudes to infant and young child feeding, its value and its place in our society. So I came to this movement from my own challenges as a first time mother and from hearing stories of mothers in my community when I was volunteering at my local Quidju breastfeeding support group and as a trainee breastfeeding counsellor there. My professional background is actually in computer science and I worked in the multinational corporate space for many years alongside sales and marketing teams and also to mention that as a young girl I grew up on a dairy farm in rural Ireland. So infant feeding is a highly contentious 
Act in Ireland, attempting to instigate discourse in this area has often been met with reluctance and trepidation. And there's been a high degree of fear that whichever type of feeding is discussed, the other type might be shamed or belittled. So that type of emotional language is limiting and no longer useful. So what language is useful? If we are to engage with those who hold the power to actually make changes, then it is useful to have guidance, leadership and tools for changing the conversation to move in a constructive direction. So the mother's milk tool is one such tool that will definitively change the narrative. Here in Ireland, it is also often difficult to make the case for equality in this space with heavy lobbying from the food and farming sectors taking place and often with criticism that to call out damaging corporate practices could potentially damage product sales, international reputation or jobs and so on. So while capitalism offers a certain freedom to choose one's destiny and to pursue prosperity, if it reaches the point where it is damaging what was not broken, then accountability must be called for. So to shift perception, the value proposition of an argument must be, as the business world would call it, disrupted, disruptive. While it is difficult for many to perhaps reconcile that support, protection and promotion of something that seems priceless or even an expression of love, often justification with a business case is part of the process and that is how public expenditure works. So the return on the investment either in the food system or for the efforts in developing policy and legislation must be underpinned by its return. So that's the use of this tool. So when I had the opportunity to use the tool for myself, I personally felt the wow effect and I thought this is disruptive. First impressions matter, particularly when interacting with politicians and the media. So my initial response was very much an emotional one. I was really moved when I saw the numbers. It shifted something in me seeing the value proposition in this format and that it is new. So having been accustomed to seeing a lot of this data for cow's milk, I could feel that this is a paradigm shift not simply an ideological position. This tool is offering a defining moment in the history of women in an economic context to see one of the many hidden contributions of women presented in this way. I was also particularly emotional upon inputting the data to see the value of milk produced by the mothers of Ireland, as well as a great sadness for the milk that was never had and is often grieved for. Particularly, I remembered all those women who wished to breastfeed and for whom it did not happen in the manner they hoped for, or that they learned about what they missed out on in retrospect. And as Julie mentioned, 82% of mother's milk is lost in Ireland based on the rates we do have. I felt a sense of huge value in myself personally uh, and in um, monetary contribution to my family and my children. Um, but I also thought to myself, I want to share this with everyone. And it has given me a newfound confidence. I also feel the tool can elevate the advocacy movement by uh, demonstrating value in a tangible and compelling way that can translate to government budgetary activities as well as the personal relatability in financial terms. So when this data is put together with the cost of not breastfeeding tool, a compelling business case can now be made to governments and policymakers for real change and to ensure the continued progress of our species rather than a regression in health and in doing so appropriately recognizing the contribution of women. Gurvmila Mahagwiv, thank you to all involved. Thank you. Thank you, Malvina, and it makes us feel wonderful to hear your response um, from Ireland. So now we'll switch across to the other side of the world to Manisha in Nepal. And Manisha is a nutrition specialist working with FHI 360, um, a public health professional with years, eight years of experience in health and nutrition design, program design, implementation and research. So she's going to give us her reaction to the tool. Over to you, Manisha. 
Well, am I audible, Julie? Uh, Julie, am I audible? Yes, sorry, yes, we hear you very well. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Julie and the entire uh, research team uh, for right, providing this opportunity. Uh, good afternoon and good evening uh, for whichever part of the world you are. I'm Manisha Shrestha, and as uh, Julie introduced me, I am a mother and also a nutrition specialist. I'm currently working with FHI 360 for uh, Suhara program, which is a multi-sector nutrition program uh, funded by the USAID. So talking about the two, you know, I, I kind of personally felt very related to this two, you know, because being a mother, you know, like in, in developing settings like our breastfeeding is actually uh, considered as a responsibility of a mother. So, you know, um, having to add that economic value to what we have done, I mean, of breastfeeding, I mean, I feel that, you know, whatever we've done to our child through breastfeeding is now actually going to be acknowledged by the government. So talking about this tool, you know, like uh, it's this tool is going to be a, a very nice advocacy tool, uh, especially for the government and the policymakers, because, uh, you know, like uh, nobody has ever thought about, you know, like breastfeeding could actually be converted into, uh, you know, like uh, economic tool or, or I mean, the economic value of the women's care for breastfeeding could actually be calculated. So um, this tool is going to be a very wonderful tool for, for advocacy uh, for the government and the policymakers. You know, like Nepal is, is uh, actually uh, beginning to um, start a human male bank in, the, in, in our country. So I think this tool uh, would be a very nice advocacy tool for establishing a uh, human milk bank and also establishing or, or kind of, you know, an, another milk bank in other parts of the cities and countries. You know, also help in kind of um, uh, extending the, the maternity protection or the maternity leave. We just have a maternity leave for three months in Nepal now. So probably this could this tool would also be very helpful to advocate government government to extend the maternity leave in the country as well, and for other budget allocations related to a breastfeeding. I'm talking about the tool, you know, thanks to Alexandra for walking us through the tool. It's very user friendly. You know, it's very easy. Anybody can use it, you know, I mean, even the mothers or, or anybody can use it. It's very simple, it's very easily created. I mean, it is provided very clear instructions and guidelines. So it's not hard to, to kind of, uh, I mean, enter the data and I mean, I'll populate the data. And, you know, like it kind of uh, populates an infographic, which is also very interesting at the same time. And, and, and anybody can grasp, grasp it very well. And I, I love the, the advocacy um, button that you've, you've added. Initially, it was not there. So, you know, like you can, I mean, enter the data at the same time and also have the advocacy brief at the same time immediately. I think that that's, that's awesome. That's, that's awesome. So, I mean, uh, just a few free, not exactly, I wouldn't say the feedback, but just a few queries that I had uh, regarding the tool is, you know, like uh, when uh, Julie mentioned in her presentation that, you know, the tool is going to be used for children uh, zero to three years of age. Um, as far as I know, you know, like um, uh, for the DHS data, I mean, we calculate for children zero to two years of age. So is there any particular reason as to why children for zero to three is considered? Because like once the child completes two years of age, the breastfeeding rate kind of declines. I think that's true for all other developing countries. So um, I, I, any particular reason as to why children from zero to three is considered? And another is, you know, like uh, once you start complementary feeding, I um, mean, the frequency of breastfeeding kind of declines. So, I mean, the volume and the frequency declines. So, so, so the cost would also alter depending on the volume and the frequency. So has that been taken into consideration while developing the tool? Uh, but since this is just an advocacy tool, I mean, I just wanted to ask if that's taken into consideration while developing this tool. Uh, thank you, Julie. Over to you. Thank you, Manisha. And those questions are important. We use the um, UNICEF data, which actually does provide information for many countries through to three years. And as I mentioned regarding Indigenous breastfeeding historically, um, it's actually not more normal to continue breastfeeding three years and beyond and part of our human evolution. Um, so any further questions? Keep post them in the chat because even if we don't get them to them tonight, we will use them to develop our frequently asked questions. But I'm, I'm now going to invite Anna Bauerig from, from, Bauerig from Norway to come and talk to us. Norway is a very special country because they have been counting mother's milk in their food statistics since the 90s. And Anna um, is going to talk to us about her response to the tool. So over to you, Anna. Good morning and uh, good evening to everyone from uh, Norway. Uh, 
my name is Anne Berg and I'm working as a nutritionist uh, at the unit on breastfeeding at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. Thank you for giving us uh, the Mother's Milk tool. We really need such a tool to demonstrate the important contribution of breastfeeding women to health, climate and food security. As uh, Julie mentioned, uh, in Norway, mother's milk production uh, has been included in uh, national food statistics since uh, 1993. The Norwegian uh, Director to Health, in collaboration with the Unit on Breastfeeding, uh, are responsible for the calculations. However, the mother's milk tool has shown us that we can make much better use of this data in our public health efforts to create a society that enables women to breastfeed. Many of us are not familiar with using the term productivity when it comes to breastfeeding. But I think that uh, this conception can be very useful for some purposes. As an example, we, there is an ongoing debate about the duration of maternity leave in Norway. And in this debate, we use the data on mother's milk production and the estimates of its economic value to demonstrate that breastfeeding is an important job. And like all other jobs, the production of mother's milk takes time. The working time for breastfeeding women is day and night. So by using uh, the concepts and measurements in the mother's milk tool, it becomes easier to argue for prioritizing sufficient maternity leave and to show that this will benefit the society as a whole. I am not aware of any other jobs that can compete with the multiple functions of breastfeeding. The contribution to better health for women and the child population, less climate footprints, and improvement of food security for the most vulnerable among us. And the mother, Mother's Milk tool can help us in communicating this. So I would encourage all to use it. It is easy and fun. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. As uh, I a no point and very clear information on the usefulness of this tool for in Norway. So now we move to the other side of the world again. We go to over to you, Anne. Hey, hello, Julie. Hello, everyone. Hello from the Philippines. My name is Diane Mendoza and I am an Arugaan trained breastfeeding peer counselor representing our mentor, Maria Ines A.V. Fernandez, the co-founder of Arugaan. Arugaan since the 1980s have been supporting mothers in their breastfeeding journey here in the Philippines. And, you know, this is just an awesome opportunity to be able to represent the team from the Philippines. I am here today to um, share my experience in using the mother milk tool and right on time because we're actually just a few days before our um, presidential elections. <laughs> so having this tool right now is such a big deal, especially here in the Philippines, because I know this would be a great tool that would be help um, that would be able to help our um, policymakers in the future. So <laughs> thank you so much for for the team of Dr. Julie who came up with this tool and everyone who's part of it. Thank you so much and for letting me be part of the testing stage. Um, first of all, I'd like to talk about the experience in using the tool. And um, the mother's milk tool is very user friendly. I mean, taking it from a perspective of a mother, some of us are really scared in using, you know, <laughs> Microsoft Excel. I'm not sure <laughs> well, with other mothers, but, you know, sometimes when we talk about technology, we're like, uh, okay, wait a minute. But then when I opened the tool, the mother's milk tool, it was just designed and it's just so easy to use. And I felt um, so 
uh, loved in a way <laughs> because the pictures that we saw, you know, having the mothers there, the fathers there, you know, we, we saw the, the worth of, of the family that, that's contributed to the tool, the importance of the family when they portrayed it in the tool. So thank you so much for the team for putting those um, pictures. And also, the tool is so important because um, the 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 breast milk is going to be measured not only by um, the country data and the individual data, the, both the government policy making bodies and individual mothers can benefit because they they see the actual value. So if I'm gonna put, you know, in, in my place, um, truly our motherhood can never can never be me measured by the milk that we produce right but seeing the overall economic contribution in actual numbers to the side to the society it already boosts our morale and our morale as mothers you know the the, the work that we do and uh, moving forward we will already think highly of what we're doing for the country even if we're just at home <laughs> Right? So I myself have breastfed my daughter for six long years. And when I use the tool, I place the numbers just for the three years and then I multiplied it by two. <laughs> I almost fell out of my chair because really I was thinking to myself, wow, that was all the work that I did. That was all the contribution that I did. And <laughs> it just really gave me that satisfaction of you know, as a mother, this is the contribution that I did for my country. And um, I know that when the tool is going to be launched publicly as breastfeeding peer counselors, we will let our mothers here in the Philippines use this tool to see the, the, the actual value of the breast milk they produce. And also we will forward and lobby this to our policymakers. The Department of Health in the Philippines should, you know, really have the taste of what you know, what we see in, in, in the mothers that they do. And, you know, in making these policies, we already have the backbone. So thank you so much, Dr. Julie and the team for really putting this out there. Maybe um, just for the overall interface, I, I love how it looks from the first sheet to the second to the third sheet. Even the new tab where the advocacy part was there, it's, it's so important. And probably as the years go by, we would request for a language option probably where it could be translated so that it's easier to understand. And also, um, I'm not sure there were already a lot of questions regarding if we, uh, what's the cap on the three years? Because I know that the average years of winning really is seven years in breastfeeding. So like for me, I did six years. So maybe later on, we could increase that up to six years old. Um, but thank you so much, Dr. Julie and the team from the Philippines. You know, we've met in Malaysia and I'm so happy that you allowed me to be part of this project. Thank you. Mabuhay. <laughs> thank you, Anne. Um, yes, in a world where our children could be breastfed on a widespread way to six years, wouldn't that be so wonderful? I should say that the Philippines and Norway have both got a special um, connection to this work because Norway was the first country to apart from measuring the mother's milk, um, Elizabeth Helsing was part of, of that process. Um, but also the Philippines um, is where Alex has also spent considerable time. And so there is a special connection um, of the tool with the work, not only of the Norwegian, but also the Philippine representatives here tonight. So thank you. Okay, we're now moving on to my country. Um, so here we have Bindi Borg, who's independent consultant, um, who's from Australia, and she's going to introduce herself and talk about the tool. Thanks, Julie, and uh, congratulations, Julie and Alex and ANU Alive and Thrive, FHI, everyone who worked on this tool. Um, it's fantastic. Thank you for giving me a chance to comment on it. So my name is Bindi Borg. I have been a development practitioner for almost 25 years, working in West Africa, the Balkans, um, South and Southeast Asia and the Pacific for various international NGOs, intergovernmental agencies and United Nations. 
And I'm also, perhaps more importantly, a mother of two children breastfed for a very long time, and I'm a breastfeeding counsellor and educator. Back to my professional work, in my, in my work, a lot of my work has been about trying to convince development agencies and governments and donors to give funding to value breastfeeding and to fund breastfeeding promotion and protection interventions. And in public health nutrition, uh, and indeed in all humanitarian and development interventions, the question is always about cost effectiveness. How much will the intervention cost? How much will, will it benefit? Uh, how much money will be saved? And how much does it cost in comparison to some other intervention? So the mother's milk tool is going to be an essential and incredibly useful tool to answer those questions. It's very easy to use, and I'll be using it for that kind of advocacy to support breastfeeding interventions. And I will certainly use it alongside the cost of not breastfeeding tool. They're two sides to the same coin, and they work beautifully together. Um, so in my, in my work life, I find there's a lot of lip service about the importance of breastfeeding. And these two tools together will, out, will, will let us put a price on uh, what it really means to fail to support breastfeeding. And the mother's milk tool actually then goes even further uh, uh, to really value women's production and, and provision of breast milk. For me, that's revolutionary. It, it means that we can no longer pretend that breast milk is a free product and that breastfeeding is a free service. By valuing breast milk, we are forced to value the women who produce and provide it. Um, for any of you who are movie buffs, I, uh, I'm always reminded of the milk mothers in Max, Ma Mad Max's Fury Road. Um, and in that sort of dystopian uh, world of scarcity, Nevertheless, mother's milk was recognised as a precious and tradable resource, and the milk mothers were valued as producers of something vital. So if it can happen in this dystopian cinematic world, surely it can happen in our world. And, and Julie and Alex and the team have, have made that possible. The lost milk tool just changes everything. When we put a value on breast milk and breastfeeding, we can think really logically and clearly about things like paid maternity leave, about gender equity, about contributions, women's contributions to their household food security. And, and we can be clear sighted about the relative value for example, of a, a Cambodian woman going to work in a garment factory while her baby is fed diluted uh, condensed milk from an unhygienic bottle, we can compare that to the attendant uh, risks of infection and underweight and stunting. Equally, we can be clear-sighted about the relative value of an Australian woman going to her job while her baby is fed infant formula by a childcare worker with the attendant risks of overweight and non-communicable diseases. So the lost milk tool really forces us to acknowledge that women are creating enormous economic value and contributing to their country's wealth and health by producing breast milk and by breastfeeding. And it also allows individual women to acknowledge that their breast milk and their breastfeeding may have equal or greater value uh, than, than their paid work may have equal or greater value than their partner's work or their child carer's work. And to me, that's a revolutionary step in gender empowerment. It gives breastfeeding women an enormous bargaining chip to say that mother's milk and mother's caring has value. So for my purposes, I will be using the advocacy briefs. Thank you for making them. They'll be so useful to present to governments and donors and others. Down the line, a future step might be to incorporate comparisons uh, to the cost of breastfeeding promotion interventions like peer counselling or BFHI. And I love what Diane was saying, or what Diane was saying. Maybe we could add for the individual calculation a certificate to print out. Yay! This is what I've contributed to my family and my country. So uh, well done, everyone. I look forward to using the tool in my future work. Congratulations and thank you so much for the excellent tool. Thank you. 
Thank you, Bindi, um, one of my fellow countrywomen. Um, it's great to hear your comments on the tool. And um, yes, we're certainly taking into account the comments that people are making about the different directions for the tool in the future. But now we're going to move back over to Europe, to across the world again, to hear from Eliane Rao. Eliane is the president-elect of the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine. Um, and she's speaking to us from Germany. So over to you, Eliane. Thank you so much, Julie. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening around the world. My name is Eliane Rau, as Julie mentioned. I'm specialized in healthy childcare, living and working in Germany. I am president-elect of the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine, a global physician organization, a member of the National Breastfeeding Committee of Germany, mother of three and grandmother of two breastfed children. And I'm honored uh, to be asked for the testing stage of this tool and to comment on at this event for this wonderful tool. And as a physician, I have been practicing for yeah, more than 30 years and I'm a long time passionate supporter of breastfeeding um, in the past decades, it was often difficult to make visible the value of breastfeeding. All too often, we talked about the advantages and mostly voluntary breastfeeding supporters did help mothers to start and continuing breastfeeding. However, for many mothers, healthcare workers and politicians, breastfeeding and human milk seemed only to be an extra a nice to have where the normal formula feeding would be enough. This has changed very slowly, thanks to the work of such wonderful scientists as Julie and others. Um, and the value of breastfeeding and human milk becomes more and more visible. We don't talk anymore about the advantages of breastfeeding. It's the normal, the standard infant and young child feeding and the use of formula feeding has considerable risks for both mothers, child, and society. Um, in the medical field, we are finding more and more data for what should have been obvious from the beginning. Breastfeeding is the default setting for mothers and children in all aspects, nutrition, immune system, hormonal transition, and bonding. But we are looking further now, we also see the economic value of breastfeeding, also thanks to this wonderful research. And I'm very, very grateful uh, to this new tale to, to make visible what should have been evident from the beginning. Breast milk, breastfeeding do have a huge economic uh, value. To be uh, honest, I'm not very computer savvy, but uh, this tool was very accessible for me. It did work, uh, uh, which is very important for me right from the beginning. And I think that is uh, from a practical uh, point of view of distributing this tool, it's very important that it is very easy to uh, manage because only at this way, it will be distributed easily to uh, parents and so. And um, as Julie mentioned, breastfeeding is not only about love, it's a major economic uh, contribution, contributing and we will see it now. We, we can put a, a, a number on it now, not only, to the own wallet of the uh, persons who are breastfeeding, but also to that of the nation in avoiding costs of illness for mother and children and not contributing to costs of environmental damage. Uh, Adriano Catania mentioned it already in the chat. I think this is also um, the environmental damage of non-breastfeeding is also adding to these immense costs of not breastfeeding um, through the wasting of resources and pollution. Um, 
it is so empowering to know for parents what they are contributing uh, in this field, uh, letting them know that it is worth what they are doing. And it gives the, the parents a pride, a feeling of pride, making it worth it even. And I think that is, it, it's an encouraging to for personal parents, even if breastfeeding is not always easy, but it is, it worth it. And, and you can even put a number on it. Of course, and that is already uh, emphasized by others, uh, it can be used by policy makers. And I will be very glad to introduce this tool at the German National Breastfeeding Committee. We are here discussing a lot about investing in breastfeeding. And I think that a never a better return on investment will be made as in uh, breastfeeding support, in paid breastfeeding support, in training, in um, um, information for parents and in support of breastfeeding. Um, I, of course, I will also share it at the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine. Many of our members are uh, key in their respective countries in policy making. And so I hope I, this tool will find its way. My congratulations to the whole team who invented this tool, and I wish this tool a very, very happy future. May it distribute it widely, and I used to give breastfeeding and human milk the visibility of the value it actually has. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eliane. And I should say that we're deeply appreciative of all the people who've tested the tool. Um, it's helped improve it and make it as accessible and exciting as it is. We have one more tester to give us an opinion. And this is uh, Dr. Adiatma Siraga, who's an economist at the Universitas Padjadjaran in Indonesia. So over to you, Adi. Yeah, thank you, uh, Julie and team. First of all, big congrats. Uh, I think this is such a huge achievement and very useful as well in our journey to promote breastfeeding. And thank you also to NU Life and Thrive VHI, FHI and partners for organizing the webinar and launching and developing the tool. So my name is Adiat Masrigar, as mentioned, from Center for Economics and Development Studies, uh, CEDS. Universitas Padajaran Indonesia and our team consists of experts in various branches of economics and one of them is health economics. And that's where I and my colleague Pipit Pitran, who has been working for me, uh, with me uh, on breastfeeding uh, studies and our health economics team uh, jump in. So since 2014, uh, CDS and Life and Thrive, we have produced some studies on costs of not breastfeeding and you know the financial need to uh, of, of policies to support breastfeeding. You know, in one way, this can be treated as, as a value of, a part of value of breastfeeding, but we have never estimated the value of breastfeeding process and the value of breast milk itself. Therefore, we found the idea of the tool is very crucial, yeah, and important in promoting not just breastfeeding, but to promote the value of, the, val the monetary value of breastfeeding itself. Now, this is a very rare information, yeah, and this, this is where the tool fills this gap. And we found the tool very easy to use, informative, and, you know, especially in showing such a huge value of breast milk, breastfeeding process, breast and breast milk loss. I mean, these are very rare information. Yeah, I mean, we, we cannot find this just uh, anywhere unless we are using this tool uh, as for now. So I, I have just calculated the value for my wife, yeah, for our two children. And that equates to uh, 68,000 US dollars. You know, it's, it's just a huge amount, yeah? And this only covers variables that can be covered by the tool, right? I mean, we know there are more stories behind breastfeeding process, yeah? There's just, just so many variation in terms of experiences that we simply just cannot take breastfeeding and breast milk for granted anymore. I mean, there are just too many stories and values behind it, yeah? So we, need, we definitely need to acknowledge it uh, properly. 
so when we try to use this we yeah when i and pipi tried to use this we had some minor minor feedbacks only you know such as probably the need for more information in several parts but this yeah has been uh, communicated with the team so i believe the team has worked hard in accommodating those revisions so but otherwise it is a very straightforward tool so we believe uh this will provide more ammo for us in indonesia and basically globally to fight for breastfeeding and show that there are still more values to discover about breastfeeding and breast milk. You know, the, the, the reality is if it comes to advocacy, um, well, monetary, monetary value is more of a universal language, you know, let's say compared to a mortality or morbidity data. Sadly, that's, that's the reality. I mean, for instance, if we said, well, breastfeeding, if we don't breastfeeding that, you know, so many cases of diarrhea, let's say, will, will occur. Yeah? And, they, and people will just say, well, okay, that's too bad, that's a PD, et cetera. But then we say, well, you know, this disease, I mean, if you don't breastfeed, we, it actually costs this much in terms, of, in terms of cost, right? And people start to say, well, wow, that's a huge number, yeah? But of course it's a huge number, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, it has always been a huge number yeah, of not breastfeeding. I mean, I mean, the consequences of not breastfeeding has always been a huge monetary value. But then, you know, this is where this kind of tools play a very important role. We just need to share this information with people. And yeah, in terms of advocacy, this is like, it's just a very important information, yeah. So we still have a long way in advocating for breastfeeding in Indonesia. I mean, we have, yeah, for instance, different understanding in different parts of Indonesia. You know, Indonesia is a very huge country, it's very diverse. Um, and you know the existence of BMS products, yeah, socioeconomic factors, you know, leave uh, maternity leave versus working, etc., lactation rooms. These are just to name a few. Yeah, so we still have a lot, a uh, long way to go. But this tool is definitely bring a welcome valuable into information in our journey. So thank you again, Julie and team, and hopefully uh, we we have a successful process in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adi. And as I said before, we're deeply grateful to all our testers who worked with a, a different version of the tool. It's not as perfect as it is now. Um, thanks to the hard work of Alex and team, we're pretty happy with it, um, but we really couldn't have done it without our testers. So now we move on to two final speakers, um, Dr. Phil Baker, who's going to speak to us from normally in Melbourne, but he's actually, I think, um, over in the, the main island at the moment in New Zealand. Um, so Phil is a research fellow at the Institute for Physical Activity and Nutrition at Deakin University, Australia. Uh, he's a senior lecturer in food policy and international nutrition. A PhD from my university, Australian National University, which is where I know him from. Uh, we've had a great research partnership over the years and today continues it. So over to you, Phil. Thank you so much as always, Julie. And it's an absolute pleasure to speak tonight on this topic uh, of transformative change in first food systems and how the mother's milk tool uh, could be uh, levered for achieving such transformation. Um, also to speak with uh, alongside so many um, wonderful speakers who have really pioneered, um, you know, research in this area, uh, including Julie, um, uh, who has, um, you know, just done so much fabulous work in this area. Uh, and also, I just want to say uh, a huge congratulations to uh, Julie, Alessandro, uh, Roger, and others at the team at Alive and Thrive. Um, for this fantastic collaboration that you've um, put together to produce such a wonderful tool. And um, what's really special for me tonight is seeing um, individual mothers and women, um, you know, uh, sharing their, their, their own estimates. And I have not come across an international tool of this nature um, where, where that is uh, direct, that it directly engages at that individual level. So this is, um, you know, I think a remarkable achievement and not just, uh, in terms of the tool itself, but also in how, uh, in, in terms of who it engages. So, um, so I'm really going to talk about this this um, 
I'm a food systems researcher. Most of my research focuses on um, uh, this question of um, what does it mean to transform the food system and how do we transform the food system to reach uh, health and sustainability objectives. And as many of you will know, this has been very high on the international agenda. We've, as Roger mentioned earlier, we recently had a United Nations Food Systems Summit. Um, but what's really evident uh, about the attention this, this um, topic of food systems is getting is the huge number of reports that are being published, um, you know, almost week after week uh, for several years, there, there was a report published. And now we have over 70, uh, I think it's almost 80 reports uh, and, uh, by international organizations that focus on this question of how do we transform uh, the food system, including by all the major UN nutrition agencies. Um, so a very much uh, topical uh, issue. Now, the definition of a sustainable food system, um, in, in my opinion, puts the term future generations um, as core to that very definition. So uh, one that ensures food security and nutrition for all in such a way that the economic, social and environmental bases to generate food security and nutrition for of future generations are not compromised. So is it, it is for the unborn children and the children uh, alive today for whom we are doing this work of, of transforming food systems for sustainability. And this uh, was where I think the, the mother's milk tool um, can make a major contribution in changing how we think about and how we value um, the way we feed uh, our future generations. Um, we, we've recently published, if you're interested in this topic of what does it mean to transform a system, what does it mean to transform a food system, we recently published this paper uh, which analyzed the recommendations of these reports uh, for their transformative potential. And this could potentially um, help to inform thinking uh, on how we um, transform um, first food systems. Um, which brings me to this uh, slide here. Breastfeeding is a major form of global food production and infant and young child feeding as, a, as, uh, as women's care work is often ignored in food systems dialogues, research and action. And many of us uh, really tried to hammer home this, report, this point during the UN Food Systems uh, Summit. In the work we've done, we've defined first food systems as the food systems that provision foods for infants and young children and that structure feeding practices at the population level. This is a very deliberate framing because in framing something as determined by a system, we shift the focus away from individual mothers and we end the blame. And I think this is um, for me, um, the very core motivation of the work that we are doing in this area. And also I know very much the work that Julie has done for decades and that the Alive and Thrive team, uh, FHI 360 team are doing as well. Um, these are some of the papers we've published on this topic of first food systems. And I'd like to draw your attention to the wonderful policy brief done by uh, FHI Solutions, Alive and Thrive and Save the Children um, team members, uh, which introduced this concept and, and in particular give uh, the, the, the importance of breastfeeding in food systems. Now we cannot talk about um, uh, the, the frame we've been using is that sustainable food systems begin with a mother-child breastfeeding diet because it is really uh, the uh, breastfeeding woman with, uh, where, where the food system begins. Uh, we've framed the diet as a, as a first food system in and of itself. It is an on-demand global food production system and arguably the shortest food supply chain on earth, unparalleled in safety, delivers uh, optimal nutrients and immunological factors, which we know evolve from feed to feed, day to day, uh, responding to the child's uh, evolving uh, developmental needs. And we know the remarkable difference that, um, bre that universal breastfeeding uh, could make in terms of saving children's lives and preventing unnecessary um, illness. Uh, but it's also vitally important to note that no other form of food production or food delivery is packaged with love in the same way that breastfeeding is and the remarkable um, effects that it has in terms of mother-child bonding, reducing stress for the infants. Um, and in a, you know, what is, what is ultimately, an, ultimately an expression of love. Uh, but what does it mean to transform a system? Um, so in our work, we describe the first food system 
as uh, comprising um, many different elements. Uh, the mother-child breastfeeding diet itself, uh, but also first food environments, the context, the settings in which um, uh, mothers uh, and women feed um, children, um, supply chains, uh, policy, governance, and regulatory frameworks, and also um, fa uh, factors of political economy, power, um, the role of the food industry, the role of governments, civil society, advocacy groups, women's groups, uh, and how these also shape first food systems. Essentially, what we are talking about here is a non-linear approach to intervening in a system. If we wish to transform food systems and first food systems to, to realize goals like universal breastfeeding, um, realizing goals like uh, the, the uh, realizing the rights of mothers, infants, and children, uh, then this, uh, uh, many of us believe is the approach we need to take. Now, a linear, a sort of an approach that we sort of adopt from biomedical thinking is the one on the left, a, a linear approach that where you intervene, you get some change and the, the outcome results. It black boxes the system. On the right, you have systems thinking concept. Uh, this, this, uh, the concept of systems thinking where the intervention uh, could be a policy or program uh, in this case, the mother's milk tool uh, has many effects. Uh, it is and has dynamic effects involving um, feedback loops um, and non-linearity. So I think this is a really important, um, and yeah, there, there are multiple um, pathways to a particular outcome that we desire. Now, when we think about how we intervene in systems, um, there has been some really groundbreaking work done by our colleagues in environmental science. Uh, Donella Meadows was the pioneer, uh, one of the pioneers of, of systems thinking um, from uh, really informed by uh, ecological studies. Um, this is one of the frameworks that is often used when we, when we ask the question of uh, understanding systems change. Uh, sis, uh, systems are, are, are understood as comprising uh, multiple components. Uh, from the bottom, we have system elements. And as we work our way up, um, we, we get to the goals of the system and the paradigm that underpins the system. Uh, now, one of, the one of the challenges that systems thinking, um, or one of the ways that systems thinking helps us to understand uh, change in systems is that the higher we go up this, this, this uh, pyramid of interventions, the potential for impact becomes much greater. But so does the difficulty because it is hard to change a paradigm. It is hard to change people's mental models. It is hard to change people's ideologies. And it is hard to change the fundamental goals of a system. Um, as Malvina said earlier, we are essentially the dominant operating economic system, political economic system uh, in the world today is, is capitalism and neoliberal capitalism. And the goals of this, um, of this uh, system are often at odds with things like breastfeeding. Now, when we talk about trend, um, uh, there, there's another way of understanding systems change is uh, in terms of orders of change. Uh, and a third order change is just to completely transform the system. The second order is to reform the system. And first order change is to adjust the system. Now, most of the interventions that we talk about with infant young child feeding are in the first, the level of the first order change. And they really are about changing systems elements, removing formula samples from hospitals, banning labels, comparing formula of breast milk and mass media campaigns to promote breastfeeding. These are important, but to, and together they can across an entire system. If there's enough of these interventions, they can generate significant effects. But if we want to really start to reform the system, we need to actually change things like system structures like removing the baby food industry from governance and from policy, for example. Establish very robust national infant and young child feeding, monitoring and enforcement systems. Uh, for example, ensuring that code violations do not go unnoticed nor unpunished. Um, but if we wish to transform the system, that is something entirely different again. 
Here we must talk about prioritizing the rights of mothers and children over corporate profits and trade. This is about the paradigm and the goals of the system. Moving away from a purely biomedical model of health professional training, and, and crucially, as many people have spoken tonight, making women's work visible and valued in economic um, decision-making. So what does it mean to challenge the paradigm in this space and how can the mother's milk tool um, really help us to get there? Uh, well, as uh, I, I'm really here just repeating what others have already said tonight and building on the work of Marilyn and Julie and others um, who have, have really been the pioneers in this space. Um, first of all, is to uh, is, is, is valuing breastfeeding as a form of care work and non-market, a form of non-market house production, which is too often invisible to economic um, decision makers. As many have said tonight, baby food sales get counted in national accounting systems contributing to GDP. However, the immense value that breastfeeding uh, women and mothers render society is typically invisible. And the mother's milk tool clearly, clearly can pay, play a huge role here when combined with advocacy, when combined with rights-based arguments, uh, this, uh, this, this has immense potential. Um, the, the, the frame that sits behind this all, of course, is that current economic output measures, including GDP, current ways of thinking about what it, what it means for a society to be successful, are dominated by a market, uh, a, a market model and a, and a very reductionist economic form of profit-driven um, uh, economics. And this is strongly biased against women's productive health and economic rights. It is manifest in the fact that so many women worldwide lack um, effective maternity protection and are illegally entitled to cash benefits, uh, especially in countries with large informal sectors. Another, another uh, area where I think the tool could really help is to raise priority, or raise the, generate attention to the economic value of breastfeeding in international uh, fora. Uh, our recent work, uh, most much of it led by um, Katie Russ, reports on the way in which uh, corporations, uh, the baby food industry, and its and governments supporting the baby food industry, including Australia, the United States, New Zealand, uh, have intervened in the World Trade Organization against other countries attempting to implement their national milk code or attempting to implement the International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes International Law. Uh, this has largely been invisible um, uh, and uh, only, only recently have, has it been reported on. Uh, this is essentially governments giving priority to um, the baby food industry uh, over the rights of mothers, infants and children. Um, this figure shows the number of interventions, the countries making the interventions and the countries at which those interventions are against. Um, and you can see there have been substantial numbers of them uh, over, over the last few decades. On the right, you can see the number of interest groups um, representing uh, governments in, in uh, the codex committee that develops the standards for infant formula and follow-up formula. Not only do we see food industry groups as part of country delegations to the Codex, but sometimes we see the, the country delegation is only industry. So there is a clearly a very strong skew towards commercial interest at Codex. And um, we are very lucky to have uh, at least some civil society representation in that fora. But again, this uh, the mother's milk tool by raising um, uh, generating attention to the economic value of breast milk, I think can help to really inform um, dialogues in some of these um, fora. The other area where we see um, uh, the, this, this huge um, undervaluation of, uh, of, of breastfeeding is uh, through its, exclu ex its exclusion from national and international food monitoring systems. And Anne spoke about this earlier, uh, Julie mentioned uh, that Norway is the, the um, is is the exception uh, worldwide in recognizing breastfeeding as part of its national um, food um, statistics. Uh, food systems are strongly gendered. Women are responsible for half of the world's agricultural production, and some 
uh, in many countries produce uh, th over three quarters of food, of all food. Breastfeeding is a crucial food source, uh, providing between 35 to 40% of the child's energy needs uh, at 12 to 23 months. The current breastfeeding rates, as Julie mentioned earlier, according to the mother's milk tool, this equates to 21.9 billion, billion liters of breast milk produced by mothers every year worldwide. And, and yet this is not seen as a form of food production. It is invisible in um, national food balance sheets in international food monitoring um, systems. Um, and, and it's also remarkable that world production is at least twice this figure, given less than, than half of children uh, are currently meeting the WHO um, re recommendations. So I think the mother's milk tool could also play an immense role in generating systems-wide change um, by demonstrating um, the, the economic value and productive value of breastfeeding. Thank you very much. Wow, that gave us the big picture. It really did. And Phil has been doing some fantastic work in this area um, that really shows us in very stark terms the political economy of mother's milk and breastfeeding. We're now going to our final speaker, um, Francis Knight, who's done an amazing little bit of research on um, processes for successful uptake of nutrition modelling tools. This has only just come out and Francis has very kindly agreed to talk to us at very short notice. Um, we're really looking forward to hearing about what it is that makes for a successful tool. Over to you, Francis. Thank you so much, Julie. Uh, please let me know if you can't see my slides or can't hear me. Um, so hello, everyone. Thank you for staying online. And it's lovely to be speaking today. Um, and firstly, I'd really like to say congratulations to everyone who was involved in developing and testing this tool. Um, it's, it's just fantastic to see. And as somebody who's been taking a lot of a very close look into different nutrition modeling tools, it's, it's wonderful to see the process that you have used as well, the amount of people you've involved and this real focus on having a user-friendly applicable tool. So I really congratulate everybody. Uh, my name is Frances Knight. I'm a PhD student at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, uh, part-time. The rest of my time, I'm based at the World Food Programme in Rome and Nutrition. Uh, I'm also a mother of twins who are still being breastfed and they're 13 months old. So this is especially exciting to me to be part of this. Um, I first wanted to introduce everybody to the Nutrition Modelers Consortium. Um, nutrition modeling tools might be a bit new to many people on this group. So just to let you know, there is a consortium of people out there who have developed many different nutrition modelers tool, modeling tools. Some of them model the cost and affordability of nutritious diets. Some of them estimate the cost of malnutrition burdens. Some of them, like uh, the cost of not breastfeeding tool, estimate the cost of, of not breastfeeding. Other users are used for specific decision-making around what interventions might be most cost-effective or what to do about malnutrition. Um, in around 2017, a lot of these tool developers came together because we saw the, the common, I guess, um, benefits that we could have of working together to improve how our tools spoke to each other, the technical aspects, but also um, look at the usability and the processes that encourage uptake and use of the, the results of these tools. One of the issues that we all identified is that even though there have been a lot of results and methods and mathematical modeling of these individual tools published out there in the literature, there was very little published on their actual impact, how the results were then taken to impact policy or policy making decisions in some way. So we wanted to do something about that so that we could make more of a, I guess, argument for funding these tools and for applying them so that we could make more of an argument for people to start using them in different countries, specifically low and middle income countries, but also to inform how we use these tools in the future. So that's where this research project came about that was done over the last couple of years. The main objectives were to document different modeling tool analyses or applications, including the objectives, the analysis, how it happened and how the results were, um, were disseminated but also then to document any use of the results and what influence that might have had on program or policy decisions. We also wanted to identify factors that strengthen or hinder the program or policy influence of these tools so that we could develop some sort of recommendations on the design and implementation of these tools 
and how we use them in the future, essentially. So not just the tools that we looked at, but also other tools going forward, such as the Mother's Milk tool. Very, very briefly, we used semi-structured interviews with tool users. Um, I'm not going to go too much into the methods, but just so you know, there were 14 different tools that we included. Uh, these are some of them. You can look at all of the details in the paper. We had 32 individual case studies across Asia, Latin America and Africa. There's some sort of breakdown there with the size of the boxes in terms of how many case studies. Uh, we spoke to people from academia, governments uh, in these countries, UN organizations and NGOs. And we split uh, tool users into three different categories. Brokers who set up or asked for a tool or funded a tool to be used, the analysts, and then the consumers, the people that were actually being targeted with the outputs of the tools. So I'm gonna really briefly recap the findings because we don't have a lot of time. But I think the main thing is that we found that the tool applications contributed to enabling environments for nutrition and nutrition policy change. And they did influence programs and policy in most cases. Going down into the specifics and breaking up these influences by the policy cycle stage where the tools were used. Um, in terms of advocacy, we found that tools increased nutrition um, commitments, validated existing policies and contributed to advocacy efforts. When used for situation assessment, the tools were really useful for addressing misconceptions around why malnutrition existed or what sort of um, solutions were needed or improving understanding about the situation by policymakers. The tools really helped um, specific issues to gain momentum or be targeted in programming, such as adolescent nutrition um, or the need for fortification or breastfeeding, for example. Um, and then more specifically, when used for program planning, the tools are really important in prioritizing particular interventions or particular um, responses to these problems over others. So being able to select the most effective or cost effective or appropriate for a particular context. And then lastly, the tools are really useful in informing program scale up or justifying improvements or more funding for individual programs. So really helping to make a case and show what was needed. But importantly, it's really necessary to point out that the tools themselves were never um, the only reason that a policy change or some sort of program uptake happened. Um, and there was also a lot of potential that we found for strengthening their influence. So a couple of things we learned then around factors that influenced the modeling tool applications and how they were used then to inform policy and program decision making. As I said, this is a very quick overview. Um, these were some of the main things that we found the reputation and acceptance of the modeling tool itself and the institution using it. If um, it was a you know, well-known university or a well-known agency that was coming in with the tool or the tool had been used in 20 other countries in the region, policymakers, health, technical people were much more likely to pay attention and then to use the results themselves. They needed to build that trust. That leads me to ownership. If people such as local technical nutrition staff or technical health staff and then their bosses and then the policy bosses above those felt that the, the analysis was theirs, that they had been involved, as opposed to something just being presented to them, they were more likely to use it themselves and also then to keep relaying it up that chain to different policy makers. That also feeds into local capacity. In certain contexts, it was possible to train up um, different groups of people to use the modeling tools. Now we're talking about very diverse tools, some of them as simple as uh, the tool that you've seen today and some of them involving you know, two weeks training. So this is a very broad, um, broad result, but it really did help where, where local people could be built, uh, sort of their capacity could be built to use these tools and to even at least understand the results, even if they didn't do the analysis themselves. Um, that was much harder when there was a lot of perceived complexity or actual complexity of the methods and their results. As we've seen, so many people today commented that because they could use the tool themselves to calculate how much their breast milk was worth, they see that it's easy and it's easy to use and they know what they're saying when they talk about the results. So that was a very big, important uh, challenge. Um, also, we found that where tools could be based on secondary data, such as national DHS, HCS data sets that belonged to governments, had been validated and were nationally representative, there was much more uptake because people trusted the numbers coming out because they trusted the numbers that were going into the analysis. So that transparency and using data that validated even work that other people had done was very important. Um, then also timing the analysis um, and, and having it at a time at targeting at particular policy issues, particular policy makers was important. 
But on the other hand, it was also important to be able to keep using the results at different times when sort of serendipitous opportunities for embedding these results in policy discussions happened. Now, both of these required capacity. And this was a big, uh, I think, missing area that we found. It's one thing training people to do an analysis, but if the people that you train or the people that are there and you expect to use the results don't have that strong capacity for translating evidence into program design or for advocating based on this evidence, it's not going to go anywhere. You just have results sitting in a folder or in a report. So this was really important. And that also then required resources. It wasn't enough just to say we're working with the local health monitoring team, we're working with the government nutrition department. If they don't have enough staff, if they're not being recompensed for their time, if they don't have the funding to come to all of the meetings, to go to a two week training, then it's really unfair to put this extra pressure on them. So resourcing the people that you expect to work on this analysis as well. And then lastly, a challenge um, that was always going to be there, if the uh, political system changed, if um, staff changed, that engagement was changed. So, you know, often tools um, or groups using the tools had to restart completely to make sure that there was that strong engagement. So wrapping that up, some really key recommendations or findings coming out of this. Uh, is that the policy influence is not the result of an individual tool alone. It's not just numbers. It's how the tool is embedded in strategic, larger advocacy efforts. So you can't just come out with great numbers and expect everything to change around it, as I think most people on this call have said. Um, you really need to couple it with activities to build understanding and ownership of the results among the people that you hope that will use the results to um, bring about policy change or inform discussions. Um, accessible tool interfaces like the Mother's Milk tool are really encouraged. However, what was even more important, um, it was high quality, simple and relevant communication of the methods and findings for people who won't be using a tool. And I absolutely loved the policy brief um, that can come out of the Mother's Milk tool. That's exactly what we're talking about here. And it's so great to see that come in at this early stage. And we only encourage other tool users to do something similar. Um, and a similar thread, capacity building to do the analysis uh, might be really appropriate and requested by local partners in some contexts. And in those contexts, we would encourage it. But in other contexts, it might even be more important just to focus on advocacy capacity first, ability to use the numbers that come out of these tools and make sure that they're applied. Um, as I said before, using secondary data really helps uh, with ownership and trust of the results. And then in many cases, um, people coached local partners to present the modeling results themselves. So instead of having somebody from the international organization or university fly in and present, building up and coaching the local partners, working over the presentations 10 times together so they present it to their peers had a big impact. Um, as I said before, you know, really then also making sure that local partners have the resources to be involved meaningfully in these endeavours. So if there's funding needed, if they need to have a, you know, person um, seconded to their organisation to help out with this, those sorts of things are really important to consider. If you're interested in reading the paper, uh, there are many, many more findings, quotes and details about all of these uh, tools. I've included a photo for this particular audience because I actually wrote the paper whilst breastfeeding my twins exclusively. So it's always gonna have a very special place in my heart. Um, we really, if there's any questions that you have about the paper, if you would like to know more about the Nutrition Modelers Consortium as well, please feel free to contact me or contact us if you just Google the Nutrition Modelers Consortium. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Francis. Um, what a superb way to end the webinar. Uh, very insightful. The tool stacks up pretty well. I'm going to now going to hand over to Roger. Um, Q and A um, dealt with um, very quickly um, because we're going to use the chat to develop. Um, frequently asked questions document. So um, I'll hand over now to the Alive and Thrive team. So um, thank you to our fabulous speakers and testers and um, over to you, Roger or Duan, Alive and Thrive. Yeah, so as uh, Shirley mentioned, uh, uh, we will have a frequent ask question. And so we could that, and I believe that we could manage to answer most of your questions in the chat box. Uh, uh, so now uh, we are going to vote for the logos for the mother's milk tool. So next slide, please. 
So we have three options. So the first option uh, is here, and the meaning for that is breastfeeding, love, and global. So, and the next one. Uh, so again, the other kind of very similar, but then we have the breastfeeding mother, love and global, the same thing, but uh, a little bit different one. And then we have the milk drop and breastfeeding mother and love. Uh, so now uh, now we will uh, uh, quickly pull out the poll and uh, we are going to, to vote for that. I might just okay. click through the options one more time. <clears throat> so there's option one, option two, and option three. I'll pop the poll up and I'll flick through them again. If you already know, you can pop your answer into the poll. That looks like that might be everyone. Uh, can you see the results there, Tuan? No? No, it looks like Logo 3 is the clear winner. Um, we had 15% of votes for Logo 1, 33% of votes for Logo 2, and 52% of votes for Logo 3. Yeah, that's good. So given that some of the participants left, so I don't know whether we could expand that to, to, to the other one also after this meeting. So, yeah. Uh, okay, so with that, uh, I believe that so I could uh, like to hand over to Roshan, please. Thank you, Tuan. Um exciting with the voting and uh, it seemed to be very clear on option three so so let's see if we need to include others in the voting or not it was a, a very obvious kind of result here um so thank you for joining us today uh, i know we're a bit over time um and you joined from all over the world so some of the time zones must be quite late especially probably in australia right now um and also thank you for your uh, warm welcome and enthusiasm for this uh, Mother's Milk tool. Um, we'd really like to thank the speech, uh, speakers and the presenters. Uh, Professor Dame Marilyn Waring, she informed us about the, the flawed foundations of our economic statistics and how accounting for time is much better. Uh, Professor Julie Smith guides us through the economic valuation of breastfeeding. Uh, and the conceptual basis for mothers for the mother's note tool. Uh, and also Alex uh, Iliama helped us navigate and use the tool. Uh, and Francis Knight just helped us to understand what makes for a successful tool. So, so a lot of lessons learned there that we can, can use, uh, including not only for the development, but also for uh, the dissemination and to ensure uptake. Um, yeah, and also very great feedback from uh, from the users with testimonials. They were both, uh, they were informative, they were even emotional, and they were uh, inspirational. Uh, and I really love this uh, process of co-creation. Um, and for example, this uh, the suggestion to add a certificate under the individual mothers 
uh, calculator. I think that was a brilliant idea. So, um, so we will uh, look at all your feedback and, and try to incorporate that in any updates. Uh, and also Dr. Phil Baker, he shared some insight on the tool as a lever for transformative change. So if you think about like the change that is needed and then investments that are needed, um, we already have some of those kind of bulk of actions that are needed. They need to, of course, be more spe specified for countries. Uh, but we, I think we can learn a lot from those actions from the Global Breastfeeding Collective that includes investments in paid maternity leave and maternity protection, um, the 10 steps to su successful breastfeeding that needs to be implemented, improve access to uh, skill counseling, uh, of course, and exploitative marketing of uh, breast milk substitutes and, on the, and other products under the scope of the code and related uh, World Health Assembly resolutions. Um, and also what's quite coming quite obvious out here is that we need to also invest in surveys so we know what the breastfeeding rates are and also monitoring progress towards the global and national breastfeeding targets. Um, yeah, and of course the community networks that needs to also uh, uh, be invested in. Uh, some additional and very specific actions uh, that was proposed today, unless you are from Norway, uh, is to count breastfeeding and mother's milk production in national food balance sheets, food statistics and food surveillance systems. Um, so we need to identify who oversees the national food balance sheets uh, and we need to work with the systems for national accounts or national statistics offices. Um, I know that Julie Smith is already well connected with the International Association for Research in Wealth and Income. Hope I got that right. Um, and many of the national st statistics offices, they are represented there. So uh, hopefully Julie can also help you with some of those connections. Um, some immediate next steps for us uh, um, would include listening to your feedback and guidance to further refine um, the experience using the tool. Um, Dr. Tuan Wen and other colleagues did a wonderful job responding to your questions in the chat box, uh, but we'll try to respond to the most by email, and we're also considering making a frequently asked question uh, document that we can upload on, on the website. Um, we also plan to publish a manuscript presenting the tool and the evidence for the estimates uh, that it generates um, in a scientific journal, and I think that's also some of the findings from uh, from Francis' paper. Uh, we will also explore expanding the scope to also cover uh, environmental impact of lost mother's milk, uh, and ideally ahead of this year's UN Climate Change Conference, COP2022, I think is around November. So we have a bit short time to do all of that. Uh, lastly, I would also like to recognize the fantastic support from colleagues uh, behind the scene and behind the screen, including Toby James and Jessica Fagan from Anu Communication, um, Nguyen Ziu Ling and Chan-Nam Zhang from Alive and Tribe Communication, and also Andini Pramono, who is the research assistant for the webinar launch and a PhD candidate at, uh, at Anu. Uh, thank you also to Naomi Hull for managing the tech and this webinar so well. Um, so finally, thank you to all the mothers out there for your enormous and visible contributions to the economy and society. Happy Mother's Day and goodbye, everyone. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.